My wife, Valerie, and I were living in a modern house five miles from Cambridge. Andrew, our youngest child, was six at the time, Rosalind was seven and a half, and Matthew was ten and a half. The pattern of life in our household was, I suppose, rather ordinary, and the day would begin when I went downstairs to uh, open up the fire that had been burning overnight and to draw back the curtains. Uh, one February morning in 1966, I had completed this domestic chore, uh, and having drawn back the curtains, I noticed on the floor a silver tankard lying on its side, and this tankard was normally kept on a shelf. Uh, I put the uh, tankard back onto the shelf, and at breakfast time, asked the family if they had any explanation as to uh, why the tankard was on the floor, and no one had. And in addition, of course, there were no signs of forcible entry into the house. The following day, I repeated my routine and uh, found the tankard for a second time on the floor. The third morning, the tankard was again moved, and in addition, I noticed the um, uh, on the dining table, there was a pottery dog normally kept at the other end of the room in the center of the table. And there was also a large vase of flowers with its water unspilled uh, on the table in front of the place where my wife normally sat. I think at that moment, I instinctively uh, felt uh, the explanation was poltergeist. From that time on, uh, the disturbances in the room became more serious. Uh, but the events always took place between 7 and 20 past 7 each morning. Uh, tables, chairs, ashtrays, cushions, ornaments would be moved and upturned, but nothing was ever damaged. Five years elapsed and my family began to see the earlier events in some perspective. Matthew, then 15, was now at public school and we had moved from our modern house to an older house, this house, which had been built in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was Easter 1971 and Matthew was home from school when suddenly all the occurrences opened up again, but this time with renewed vigor. Well, I think the thing that sticks out in my mind most was the fact that we would go into one room and find that everything was upside down. It was as if the room had imploded and everything was thrown towards the center. You'd find tables on top of one another and chairs overturned and everything taken off the walls. Just as I've arranged this room to give you some idea of what it was like, sometimes every room in the house was like this. As soon as we tidied up the first room, we would find the second room exactly the same. And then by the time we cleared the second room, the first room would be again disarranged. Beds would be stripped or turned upside down or upended. And on one occasion, I even remember my sister's bed was stripped and then put half out of a first floor window so that it was all the bed clothes and half the bed hanging out of the window. I remember one occasion we uh, had a broom on the landing and we went upstairs and found it was balanced across the banister at the top, just sort of like this, in midair. And it was exactly perfectly balanced. And we took it away and tried to rebalance it and it was extremely difficult to do. I remember when I was in the kitchen with my younger brother and, we were, and the trolley came towards us at quite a speed. And it didn't make any noise, so we presumed that the wheels must have been above the ground. We were so scared, we just ran away. I could see no early uh, conclusion to these events, and I was becoming increasingly concerned uh, for Matthew's position when he returned to school. Uh, I could see that possibly he would be uh, an outcast or victimized. Um, or that he would be accused of stealing, possibly, or that some other boy, quite innocently, would be compromised. And I was most anxious that this shouldn't occur. I remember very clearly the hastily convened meeting that I had that Sunday evening with the headmaster. As a housemaster and a headmaster, one does meet with a variety of situations in education, but I must say that the strangest I think that I've ever encountered was this meeting with Mr. Manning in back in the summer 
of 1971. Uh, my immediate reaction, rather, as an old square, was to discount a good deal of what he'd told me, and I did feel that, well, in the hurly-burly of a boarding house, of a school, and the rough and tumble generally, somehow these manifestations, these disturbances, might very well not occur at all. Anyway, I was p certainly perfectly prepared to try this out. Well, in point of fact, from a very early stage that term, after a day or two, uh, disturbances did undoubtedly occur. Well, this is the dormitory that I slept in with 25 other boys, and in actual fact, this is the very bed that I slept in. And frequently, this bed would move. You could see it's a very heavy bed, and it would move over to the beds over there. There were lights that appeared on the wall, and the wall, if touched, was warm. Uh, there were sudden showers of um, extraordinary items, bits of broken glass, bits of chain, bits of cutlery, which would descend uh, sometimes in the dormitory, sometimes in the changing room, with a cloud of witnesses. Uh, in his study, the radio or the record player would get mysteriously switched on or off, by no apparent human agency, books would move and so on. And I think we were all satisfied that something quite inexplicable, rationally, was, was happening. I was in the same dormitory as Matthew and we had some very unusual experiences happening. I remember one boy in particular was uh, very frightened of all these things that were going along, on in the dormitory. And he took a Bible up to bed with him, hoping that this would protect him from what was going on, keep all the... Uh, the knives that were being thrown at everybody at bay. Um, it didn't seem to do much for him. It, it just seemed to aggravate the situation. He seemed to get more of these knives and forks and so on thrown in his direction than anybody else did. Um, these knives and forks used to come flying at us from all directions. Uh, they never used to hit us, so we, although they frightened us at first, afterwards we began to just take it for granted that they would miss us by inches. The domestic staff, which were engaged to come and clean the boys' dormitories daily, always used to start their work after the boys left their dormitory at 8 o'clock and there on they were not allowed to go back in there again. And the staff came to me, not once, but several times, as they made them, and was at it again, and I'd go back to their dormitory and find a chair across the door one couldn't enter, beds had been twisted and mattresses upturned, and such phenomena. I stumbled across a way of stopping the poltergeist purely by accident. About the time when this poltergeist activity was going on, I was writing an essay. Um, I don't know, I can't even remember what it was about. And I had my hand just poised slightly above the paper, and I was thinking of what to write next, because I couldn't think of anything. And I must have gone off into a daydream more. And my hand suddenly went down and I started scrawling across the paper in an illegible and incoherent writing which didn't make any sense. And that surprised me, and I didn't know what had happened. And so I ripped up the piece of paper, I think probably because I was frightened more than anything else. And then I noticed that for about three days after that had happened, we had no poltergeist activity at all. And it seemed that I had to empty my mind as completely as I could. And then, when my mind was almost completely empty, my hand would start moving and it would write in a handwriting that wasn't my own. And I kept doing automatic writing and this was eventually what stopped the poltergeist activity. Well, after about two or three years, the writing became e easier and easier to do until eventually I could more or less just sit down and do the writing at will, although I couldn't always um, get who I wanted to write for me. And then the writings all the messages began to come in different languages, foreign languages. And as I can only speak French, I think this surprised rather a lot of people, especially when I s received messages in Arabic and Russian. I had all the foreign scripts translated. The Arabic script I sent to the American University of Beirut, where Professor Suhil Bushroi translated and analyzed them. He was so interested that he came to London and presented us with uh, some very startling facts, apparently. These scripts were written by five different people from entirely different cultural backgrounds. Also, all the scripts referred to a person called George Lane, who apparently had been murdered in Saudi Arabia.
I made subsequently inquiries uh, about this person, George Lang, at the Saudi Arabian Embassy and other authorities, but as soon as I mentioned the name, nobody wanted to know, and I couldn't get very much further. The most intriguing case is there are 15 letters or messages signed by Kephalas Nectarios. He was a bishop in the Greek Orthodox Church who died in 1920 and was made a saint in the Greek Orthodox Church in 1961. These messages are all addressed to Archbishop Athenagoras, the present Metropolitan of the Greek Orthodox Church in Great Britain. It would be far too complicated to go into the details and contents of these letters, but His Eminence, the Archbishop, studied them very carefully and subsequently issued a statement which was then published all over Europe. And this is partly what he said in the statement. The case of Matthew Manning is beyond any form of logical investigation. I can positively say that the young man has been in no position to know of certain things which were contained in those messages. And when asked by a journalist why he thought that Bishop Nectarios was sending messages through an outsider, his eminence answered, I have always accepted that God has many ways in sending messages to his people, even to his archbishops. The other person that interested me was somebody called Robert Webb, and I had a lot of writing from this man. And we then went to the public records office in Cambridge and found that this man had actually lived in this house between about 1680 to when he died in 1733. I then had to do a project for school, and it was a history project, and I decided to do a project on 18th century um, social life, and I decided that I was going to concentrate on Robert Webb. I hadn't got much information about him. I'd been to the public records office and they couldn't help me much because most of the documents had been lost um, through flood water. And it was about this time when I needed a lot more information to make up the project that Robert Webb said in some automatic writing that he would supply all the names that were missing that I needed. And he said that there were about half a thousand. From that moment on, in this room, which at that time was my bedroom, my bed was along here, these names began to appear, and we came in one morning and we found this Robert Webb scrawled across the wall. We shut the room up again, and we came back about ten minutes later and there was another one scrawled on the wall, and which is also Robert Webb. These signatures continued to appear at the rate of 70 or 80 each day until we got about 500 all over the door and the walls and even on the ceiling. It was interesting to note that every signature was dated. Nobody actually ever saw the signatures appear, but one only had to leave the room empty for five minutes or so, and then we'd come back and find more signatures. I started to number the signatures, and also put big letters up on the wall so that it would make documentation easier. We were all amused when a new signature appeared, utilizing the letter T that I'd put up on the wall to write the name Thomas Buck. One night, we found in this old-fashioned handwriting on the door, signed by Robert Webb, Zeno, Hearing a young man speak too freely says for this reason we have two ears and one tongue because we should hear much and speak little. The next morning we all came down to breakfast and observed at the place usually occupied by myself a flyleaf from a book. Upon this flyleaf was repeated with the same misspellings and in the same handwriting the quotation that earlier had appeared on my door. Upon the reverse side in a different hand was inscribed Thomas Coas, write this on the last day of July 31st, 1791. The date when the message appeared on the door was 31st of July, 1971. Over the last few years, I've had literally hundreds of messages in automatic writing from Robert Webb, and the last one of which I received this afternoon actually while we were filming. I wrote down, what do you think of all these lights that are in your house? He replied, such pretty light as I never see in mine house. And such a pretty light on mine stairs. Oh, for some pretty light in mine bedchamber. Oh, and such many persons in mine house. So I then reminded him that it was not his house, but our house. Never have I heard the like of such nonsense, he said. 
off with you. And then he signed his name very angrily, Robert Webb, in big scrawly writing. Well, as well as the automatic writing that I do, I also get a lot of automatic drawing. Many of these are signed by well-known artists like Dürer, Picasso, Rowlandson, Clay. I don't always get drawings, of course, from people whose work I like. I get a lot of drawings from Picasso, and I don't like his work, and I don't like him doing drawings through me. I find him a very aggressive artist, and I rather feel he likes to dominate me. And somebody like Dürer, who is another artist who I've had a lot of drawings from, is completely the opposite. Dürer is much more delicate and gentle than Picasso, who has on occasions even smashed my pens. Beardsley is an interesting artist, and when he draws, he always makes a mistake and then will proceed to black it over or turn it into something else. Of course, not all the drawings are signed by well-known artists. A lot are unsigned, and there are also many with signatures of artists whom we have not yet managed to trace, including the, the drawings of birds, which I most like doing. These drawings always start from the center and then work out towards the edges. I always find it interesting to do these drawings because I never know until the picture is finished what I'm going to draw. It's a bit like having a magic painting book where you just put on the water and the picture appears. Only here, I just start drawing and I don't know what I'm going to draw. And then the drawing just appears. They're also drawn at a speed which is far faster, I'm sure, than most normal artists can draw. The drawing I did for this film took only about seven minutes. We've done two experiments with Matthew, looking at his brain waves while he is uh, bending keys or bending forks. Now, what we did was we hooked up an EEG machine. This is essentially a, an amplifier for looking at brain waves. And we used the special electrode arrangement that we've developed. The particular way that the experiment was done, we had Matthew just sitting in a chair, uh, with his eyes open, relaxing, and then with his eyes closed, relaxing. Then I would give him a key and ask him to do whatever he does, uh, whatever goes on inside his head. When he bends the key, that's what I would ask him to do. Now, at the moment that he would bend the key, just the 10 seconds, just preceding that moment, we had some very interesting findings in his brain waves. It's something that had never been seen before in a natural experiment like this, in that the pattern of the brain waves was like a ramp function. At the low frequencies on his brain waves were in high amplitude, and the higher frequencies were very much attenuated. And that's a curious finding. It's curious because that particular uh, ramp function is produced by only one group of cells in the brain. Now that group of cells is called the nucleus accumbens. Perhaps for the first time, we may have a glimpse as to where in the brain this particular psychic ability is being controlled. And that's a breakthrough. The general rule, I think it uh, could be dangerous trying to control things. Uh, people who have natural psychic abilities and uh, feel confident about using them, it's all right for them to do things. But, um, a little dubious about whether people who, uh, who can't control these things should try and do so. The two questions that I'm asked most frequently are A, do you consider yourself a spiritualist? And B, what are you going to do with yourself in the future? Well, the answer to the first question is that I don't consider myself a spiritualist. I would say that I'm a spiritist. A spiritist is somebody who believes that one can communicate with the dead. A spiritualist is somebody who turns that belief into a quasi-religion. I don't intend becoming a full-time metal bender or spoon bender. I can't think of anything more banal than bending spoons for the rest of my life. I don't intend becoming a full-time medium either. That doesn't agree with my views, because I don't think one should make money out of gifts such as I have.